the Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. Today, we'd like to welcome our panelists, Derek J. Freeman from Bitcoin Philadelphia. Hey. Davi Barker from shinybadges.com. Hello. Megan Lords from Bitcoin Not Bombs. Hello. And Will Pengman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Hey there. The Bitcoin Group is sponsored by Alpha Line Technologies. Alpha Line Technologies, they don't make the altcoins, they make the altcoins of the future. Learn how to make your own altcoin today at alphalinetechnologies.com. The Bitcoin Group would also like to announce that we've reached a major milestone. The Bitcoin Group now has more than 1,038 subscribers on YouTube. Thank you all for your generous support. Subscription and donation information at thebitcoingroup.com. And we'd also like to announce that we've added a Cripsy trade key. So if you'd like to send us any kind of altcoin and increase the likelihood of that altcoin being discussed on the show, please send your altcoins to our Cripsy trade key that's available at thebitcoingroup.com. Issue one, net neutrality, shut down. Verizon recently won a minor court case that will allow them to accept bribes for delivering some internet traffic faster than others. The decision is a disaster for the open internet and all thinking people everywhere should boycott Verizon and cancel their service immediately. What can we do to stop this telecommunic telecommunications giant from destroying the open internet that we all know and love? Derek J. I am not concerned. People vote with their dollars, and they will do the right thing in this instance, thinking people will switch over from Verizon and they will use other uh, providers. It's as simple as that. Uh, we still have the freedom to uh, vote with our dollar, and that will be the solution in this instance. Davi Barker. Uh, let the market decide. If large firms start making decisions that the consumer doesn't like, then small firms can take up that opportunity to take up market share. If um, there are large monopolistic firms providing internet service, then that is a single point of failure, which means that it will fail, which means that we'll all be pushed into other alternative service providers. The way I see it, the less regulation that the state puts on internet service providers, the more of a diverse marketplace in internet service providers can exist. Megan Lords. Yeah, I don't expect Verizon or these other large uh, corporations to act ethically, but I don't trust the government to restrain them either. So I think we should leave it up to the market uh, and you know let people choose for themselves and, and leave Verizon if they're going to be acting that way. Will Pengman. Um, you know, when I heard the news, I wasn't surprised one bit. Um, you know, we hear things like this coming out all the time where, you know, there's, there's a lot of platitudes, there's a lot of spin about, you know, whatever measures might be taken to give a corporation a favorable position in the market or to maybe give um, a government agency or, you know, just the, uh, the government itself more, um, more dominion than it deserves or, or certainly should have. Uh, I think what this does is it just kind of stokes the arms race in technology that we're seeing uh, and I guess what I'm looking at is the open source movement, if you will, compared to all of these proprietary systems that are being deployed all the time, and they're very slow. Um, I don't think they, you know, the, these large corporations with, with um, you know, all their moving parts and their slow deployments of new technology can outpace the innovation of the open source um, software developers and, and new applications. So I'm really excited kind of about this because I think it uh, kind of puts a little fire under the pants of, um, you know, the projects that are out there building a freer internet for us in, you know, currently, things like mesh networking and, and so on. So um, I kind of see this as a positive. You know, the, even though the, the Iron Fist has a velvet glove on, um, you know, the entrepreneurs out there building the open source solutions to all of these closed systems, these proprietary systems, um, 
they they can see right through that velvet and and they know what's coming and, and they're way ahead of the game and um, they're eager to give us decentralized solutions here to these problems so um, you know I kind of root for the iron fist to drop because it exposes the kind of hypocrisy in the control structure uh, and and the hypocrisy being that uh, you know they can claim dominion but they really don't have it and we can demonstrate this through a lot of the innovations that I'm seeing in the tech sector. That's interesting, Will, and I do think that it does give an option for mesh networks to come along and save us. I've always thought that if only Wi-Fi went a little bit further, like WiMAX or another solution, we could have these overlapping, overlapping packets of mesh networks where you could get your files the normal way. It would just bounce through five other local people, more of a local internet. We'd like to welcome Andreas Antonopoulos to the call. He appears to be muted, but if you'd like to comment, Andreas, we were discussing net neutrality being struck down by Verizon. You know, it's 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 a really it is a terrible thing that after years and years of uh, internet innovation being fueled by the fact that anyone can participate at any size and deliver innovation simply by doing something smart at the edge of the network. Now we have once again gatekeepers who will use this power to give us a, gar a walled garden internet, an internet where innovation is stifled because of the requirement to ask for permission. Netflix would not have happened without net neutrality. Facebook would not have happened without net neutrality. eBay would not have happened with net without net neutrality. Craigslist would not have happened. All of the internet, all of the good things would not have happened without net neutrality. So we need to fix this, not because it affects Bitcoin, but because it affects our ability to continue to use the internet as a source of incredible innovation, and it's so short-sighted. Um, essentially, you've just handed this ability to these gatekeepers uh, to extract uh, rent-seeking fees uh, from everyone as access gatekeepers, and we know what happens then. Uh, they turn it into a mess. Absolutely. Well put. Exit question. Will net neutrality be saved? Yes or no? Derek Freeman. Yes, of course. People are already working on it. One solution that I recommend people check out is something called Open Garden. Davi Barker. Um, I think it will be back by popular demand. Um, but I, you know, I don't anticipate it being as uh, much of a panacea as people want it to be. Megan Lords. Yes. I'll keep it simple. Will Pangman. Uh, I'm optimistic usually on things, and I, I'm inclined to say yes. Um, Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, not in the U.S. Hopefully in uh, places like Europe when they're going to have strong laws to, uh, to really not allow incumbents to take the, whole, the ball home and, and not allow the rest of us to play. But in the U.S., the average consumer doesn't understand the value of net neutrality, so we just lost a huge, huge benefit. That's a horrible, horrible thing to say. Issue two. The Sacramento Kings begin accepting Bitcoin. The Sacramento Kings, recently sold to Indian technology billionaire Vivek Randeev, says he's wasting no time in making sweeping changes to the Kings, including taking his children's suggestion and becoming the first team in the NBA to accept Bitcoin for both tickets and gear in the fan store. As I'm sure you all recall, the Bitcoin group famously predicted on 12-12-2013 that perhaps a sports franchise would one day be bought with Bitcoins. But would you accept? But who would have thought that one would accept it so soon? A truly stunning development. Your thoughts, Davi Barker? I don't care about sports. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be shopping with the Kings. But what I think is really good about this story is that he's taking the advice from his children. And I think that that sort of um, expresses the generational gap that is going on with the future of money. And I think that it is wise for the elder generation to look to the younger generation for leads. Megan Lords. 
Yeah, I know nothing about sports, uh, but I do think it's great news. And entertainment is a huge industry that Bitcoin needs to get involved in. And uh, I think this is the first step towards that. And I think, uh, like Davi said too, the fact that he's listening to younger generations about that and, and he's open to that is a really good thing. I'd like to see more of that. So, yeah, I think they're setting a, a good precedent. I, I'd like to see other uh, sports teams get involved and musicians. I mean, it doesn't have to be limited to sports. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's great news. Will Pengman. First Snoop Lion and now the Sacramento Kings. I mean, these are these are nice developments to see. You know, those those um, franchises attract a mainstream audience, and we know that Bitcoin is now relatively permanent in the lexicon. You know, here in North America and in many other places of the Western world, that's a great thing. It allows our um, introduction to people who know nothing else other than the name Bitcoin. Uh, a leg up in, you know, kind of skipping over some of the what is uh, discussions that need to be had and going right to why Bitcoin, which um, I really appreciate, uh, you know, having being the opportunity to be able to just get right to the why, um, especially with people in the U.S. where all of us are, um, you know, most of us full time here in the U.S. and, and we have a very you know, we have a different um, message that we need to deliver, you know, to the mainstream audience than the rest of the world does to their so-called mainstream audience. Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, I got into technology because I got kicked out of every sports team that ever played anywhere near me. Uh, that was if balls weren't flying towards my face and uh, I wasn't getting bullied for it. So um, I have no idea who the Sacramento Kings are. Uh, but uh, what that means is Bitcoin is going mainstream because I am definitely not mainstream. So if I've never heard of it, that's a good thing. Uh, yay. Derek J. Yeah, imagine if people cared about things that actually matter as much as they care about sports. Sports are the opiate of the masses, and every business that accepts Bitcoin is a domino that leads to other businesses accepting Bitcoin. So just another domino, but it happens to be a big domino connected to a lot of other dominoes. So I've been telling people about Bitcoin for years and nothing has excited the masses more than a sports team selling hats and jerseys for Bitcoin. And tickets. I think it's a really major development and like like Megan was saying, it's and Davi was saying, it's an important development because they listen to their children. The children said why don't you accept Bitcoin? This is so behind the times. All these lines, all these people dealing out change. What is this, a casino? Casinos don't even use change anymore. They the don't even accept so square. coins, really. Hmm? I don't know. But, I mean, listen to the children. Listen to, perhaps we could get Hilton Hotels on board if we could only get Paris Hilton to take Bitcoin. Is it really that easy? <laughs> I mean, it might be. Yeah, the generational thing is a really important uh, litmus test. If, uh, as as Davi just said, if if dollars are seen as square and Bitcoin is seen as the currency of the new generation, uh, that's a battle we can win uh, decisively. Absolutely. Exit question: Will it be all NBA teams next, or will Bitcoin acceptance branch out to other sports? Which team will accept Bitcoin next? Davi Barker. I think it's uh, got to be the 49ers because of the honest currency implications of the name. <laughs> Megan Lords. I don't know the Portland Honey Badgers. I don't know any sports teams. Like I, I've got no clue about you know anything to do with sports. Um, I, I think we're going to see a break into other sports, though. <laughs> this, is, this is really not my area of expertise. I, I think we're going to see it spread to a lot of different, um, yeah, the, outside of the NBA, a lot of other sports. Sport Will Payment. Yeah, I don't see any major leagues um, accepting Bitcoin far and wide anytime soon, but I certainly think some of the... Um, the teams or franchises in parts of the developing world that have struggling currencies. You know, the soccer league in Argentina comes to mind, or maybe even the Argentinian national team. You know, the World Cup's right around the corner. Um, so I think we'll see a team here and there. But 
this is not the exciting part for me. I guess uh, what I what I get amped up about is you know we talk about making predictions in in past shows, and we're thinking you know. We, every time we see a new announcement, we're still in this phase of being excited about the new announcement when it's a big name that most of the people, you know, in the Western world know about. And uh, the fact that a professional sports franchise in one of the most popular professional leagues in the world just went out and took the risk, it's, there is no risk, really. They just have to be bold enough to announce this and implement it, and it's very easy to implement. I mean, all of us here know this. Uh, the rest of the audience who might pay attention to, you know, news from Overstock or news from the NBA, they don't know this, how easy it can be. So I really like the bold gesture and the fact that it's happening so soon in the new year when we're making these predictions, um, ambitious predictions, you know, uh, relatively soon. Thing, you know, we're predicting things to happen pretty soon, and then they happen even sooner than we predict. That's exciting to me. Andreas Antonopoulos. Yeah, the sport I'm interested in is international remittances, uh, helping one billion people uh, lift themselves up from poverty by giving them more of the money they have earned. Uh, that's a sport, right? <laughs> Derek J. Yeah, I think it's going to be the L.A. Lakers or, like Davi said, the San Francisco team. It's going to be someone in California or possibly Boston. I could see, like, Patriots uh, type of area. It, it depends on the clientele. It's going to be someone in a more tech-savvy area, California or maybe some parts of uh, Boston, some, some similar to that. Um, yeah. I think that Will San made Jose Sharks. Point. San Jose Sharks, good point. I think Will made a good point by bringing up Overstock.com in comparison with the Kings. With the Kings, what you have is an actual brick-and-mortar retail establishment where they're selling hats and T-shirts, they're selling tickets, they're accepting tickets, all for Bitcoin in real time. With Overstock, you have the online example. So now both major retail in brick-and-mortar and major retail online, you have a, a gigantic example of why they should accept Bitcoin. That being said, the next team to accept Bitcoin will be the Dallas Mavericks, and they'll accept Litecoin as well. Perhaps Dogecoin. Why not? Issue three. Gavin goes to the CFR. Lead Bitcoin developer Gavin Andreessen is going to the mouth of the lion, to the Council on Foreign Relations. The Council, on its face, runs the popular magazine Foreign Affairs and often has speakers, usually broadcast on CNN at its meetings. This meeting, however, will not be televised. Are the rich trying to take over Bitcoin or merely to understand it? Do they think that Gavin is our leader? Do they think that through him they can control Bitcoin? Megan Lords. If they think anyone is our leader, they don't understand Bitcoin. Um, but it is interesting. Uh, I'm surprised this didn't come sooner, honestly. Uh, the CFR is a major organization. And actually, it's these kind of organizations that I'm more concerned about than government regulators at this point. I mean, these are international organizations. That, you know, the rich are obviously concerned about uh, the future of Bitcoin and what it means, uh, like Andrea says, for the rest of the world. Uh, they see a lot of wealth to be stolen, and uh, I'm sure that they're uh, going to try to, you know, get control of it in any way they, that they can. Um, so... I don't think, that, of course they can't, you know, through him control Bitcoin. Uh, that, that's not possible. I, I think they're curious, but I think they also are aware of the implications Bitcoin has. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's very telling that this isn't going to be televised. So uh, I think it'll be interesting. I mean, I would like to see footage of it if, it, if that somehow uh, becomes available later. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, and... Uh, yeah, I, I think we should be a little bit concerned, but not, you know, overly paranoid. I, I'm not necessarily a, a conspiracy theorist in regards to the CFR, and, you know, I, I think there's probably some shadowy politics involved, but, uh, you know, I, I think the main conspiracy is that powerful people are going to work together to retain their power over other people. So, uh, yeah, there's some concern, and... Uh, I'll be interested to see if, if they do end up, uh, you know, releasing that footage and letting uh, the little people see it. Will Pangman. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree with Megan. It's it's more interesting to me um, what uh, think tanks and roundtable groups um, 
take away from this new technology than, say, you know, regulatory bureaucracies. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting that they chose the lead core developer of Bitcoin um, as opposed to a, thought, a different thought leader. Um, I, I think of only maybe three or four people that just in my experience in the Bitcoin space over the last year and a half or so, um, I can think of only a handful or less um, people that I would prefer or feel more comfortable about going to speak in front of the CFR in a closed door session that we probably won't um, uh, get to see anything from. Um, and, uh, you know, Andreas, you'd be one of those. But um, it's, it, it's interesting that they chose Gavin, the core developer. I'm one, uh, there's some definite strategy there, I think, rather than, say, Patrick Merck or um, maybe Jeff Garzik or Andreas or whoever. Um, that's, uh, you know, it's curious. It's curious. It's curious, of course, that we won't get to probably see the proceedings either, or at least that one speech. So um, hopefully, like, like Megan, uh, we'll get to hear some feedback. I'm sure we'll hear some feedback, but it'd be nice to, to hear uh, what Gavin says. You know, maybe he'll produce his speech and share it with us. That'd be nice in the spirit of open source. Um, yeah, uh, I don't really see any harm that can come from Gavin talking to the CFR. It's a good thing. All of these seemingly negative um, stories that might come out, they, you know, it's all good exposure for Bitcoin. Um, and you know, Bitcoin will do what it wants. Andreas Antonopoulos. Well, I, I can tell you for sure I'm entirely the wrong person to go talk to the CFR. In fact, I think Gavin is just about perfect for the job. Uh, Gavin is pragmatic, he's moderate, he is focused on the technology. He will deliver uh, factual information in an even tone, in a non-threatening tone to very powerful men. I very, uh, and I mean men, <laughs> and I hope uh, at, at the back of this there's a waiter who brought his uh, iPhone with him uh, so that we can watch the video afterwards and find out if it's 99% of us or 99.9% .9 of us who are takers uh, from these givers or something like that where we hear the secret transcript of this conversation. Um, the CFR, you know, rich people who want to have an interest in money, so of course they have an interest in Bitcoin. Um, I'm not particularly worried, and I think Gavin is the perfect person to go and talk to them and give them a balanced perspective on uh, Bitcoin. I, I probably would never leave the room. I'd be arrested. Derek J. I'll keep it simple. The rich are trying to take over Bitcoin. They absolutely think that Gavin is the leader, and they think that they can control Bitcoin through him. Sunlight is the best disinfectant, and closed-door meetings among high-profile power brokers are suspicious at best. That said, he shouldn't eat or drink anything offered. Bitcoin is also user-neutral, so anyone can benefit from it. Davi Barker. I think to invite Gavin as an ambassador of Bitcoin and to acknowledge Bitcoin as a matter of foreign relations is the first acknowledgement of the Bitcoin economy's sovereignty by international political organ or by uh, legacy political organizations. And as a citizen of the Bitcoin economy, I invite friendly people from all nations to visit our shores, to engage in free trade, to engage in Bitcoin tourism, and to learn from our unique culture and way of life, and who knows, maybe even immigrate to the Bitcoin economy. Well said, Dolly. <laughs> well said. Yes. I'd just like to add that Bitcoin is bigger than one person, one developer. All code will be peer-reviewed. This project has come too far to be defeated by a back door or a flaw. Bitcoin will survive. Issue four. Bitcoin Meetups 2014. 2014 is the year of the Bitcoin Meetup, with over 300 meetups listed on meetup.com. These plucky meetup groups are banding together, sharing information with each other, and becoming more than just social clubs. They're becoming teams of activists with one goal, total Bitcoin acceptance. Question. Will 2014 be the year of total Bitcoin acceptance? And are the Bitcoin meetups groups the right way to get it done? I ask you, Will Pangman. Uh, no and yes. Um, you know, it's going to... The meetups... Uh, you know, I know the reason I started one in Milwaukee was to 
fast track adoption as much as possible, and there was zero presence here in Wisconsin um, in early 2013. And uh, and I didn't see much in the Midwest either, you know, even with uh, Butterfly Labs in Kansas City, there's very little action there just outside of their uh, office. And Chicago, you know, the largest city in the Midwest, there's not much. Um, you know, a couple businesses here and there, and they do have an active meetup. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the meetups are the best way to fast-track adoption. Building a human network on top of the Bitcoin platform is one of the most important projects as I see it. And um, that's what I've dedicated my time to. So um, I'm really eager to uh, increase the health and growth of um, meetups that exist that maybe aren't as active or, or slightly weaker than some of the other ones, uh, and, and also start new ones in a Johnny Appleseed kind of a fashion. Uh, wherever, wherever there are interested people who just need a little you know, kick in the pants or some materials to help get them started, a rubric to follow, um, you know, that's, that's the kind of things that I'd like to produce for, uh, for people. And there's, like, I think five meetups, five Bitcoin meetups in Wisconsin in the last uh, seven months since the one in Madison was first started and lasted a month until the one in Milwaukee was started. So um, it's exciting. I, this is one of the, this is my pet project, and, and it's one of the things I get uh, so encouraged by. The amount of talent that gravitates to these meetups in all of these localities is staggering. And I've uh, done some homework and tried to network myself into um, other towns and, and regions in the country that have meetups, and and in, you know encountering the level of talent in some of the members there is really inspiring. And everyone's working on some or many projects, and um, yeah, it's the thing that gives me the most optimism um, in the face of some of these somewhat negative storylines that might emerge. Andreas Antonopoulos. Now, Bitcoin is a, is a network, and it exhibits network effects, and the Bitcoin community is a social network, and that just strengthens the network effect. Uh, meetups are the most important tool we have to spread Bitcoin. Um, I think we need to look uh, beyond just the local meetups and, and think of other ways we can uh, get organized. Uh, I run a meetup here in San Francisco, the San Francisco Bitcoin Developers Meetup, so one of the things we can think of is also having meetups for developers to teach people how to code in Bitcoin. Um, and also we're seeing here in uh, California around Silicon Valley the emergence of a number of hacker spaces and collaborative working spaces where Bitcoin startups get together and they collaborate to innovate. So uh, meetups for regular users uh, to create an audience and to support the adoption of, of Bitcoin. Uh, Satoshi circles where we can trade and exchange Bitcoins in, in open air markets. Uh, Bitcoin developer meetups so we can teach people how to code, startup collaboration workspaces. Uh, whenever I go to a conference, I also visit the local uh, region's meetups in order to speak at the meetups and speak to the, to the crowds that come and are passionate about Bitcoin uh, and perhaps can't afford a conference but can afford to go to a meetup. Uh, so I, I would encourage everyone to participate in as many of these local communities as they can. Derek J. Yep, 2014 is the year of total Bitcoin acceptance. I can't wait. Uh, so much can happen in a year, and people have already hit the ground running. Uh, the acceptance that we've seen with Overstock and the San, uh, those Kings sports team, whatever, is uh, just an indication that this is going to be the year. Um, Meetup groups are a great way to get it done. They're cheap and easy to set up and can even have an online presence as Will and uh, the New York Meetup has exhibited. So even if you don't have a Meetup group in your area, you can still virtually attend others. And it's the most essential part of these Meetup groups is going to be the person-on-person -person connection <laughs> of like, here's how you set up a wallet. Here's how you send Bitcoin. Um, there's no thing on the internet that can replace having a person hold your hand and walk you through that. So I think the meetup groups are still essential at this point. Davi Barker. You know, there's no such thing as a dollar meetup group. Uh, most, people <laughs> learn how, most people learn how to use dollars watching their parents at the grocery store or maybe getting their first job and opening their first bank account or, or something along those lines. So while I think that the meetup groups are a significant stepping stone towards total acceptance, by the time we achieve total acceptance, they will be, they will be superfluous. They will have made themselves obsolete. There is a dollar meetup group. It's full of old white men, and it's called the CFR. <laughs> and Gavin Anderson is going to speak to them. 
<laughs> it's the lamest meetup group in history. <laughs> <laughs> Megan Lord. Well, total Bitcoin acceptance will only come as soon as the work that Bitcoiners put into our efforts for spreading the word. So I think Bitcoin meetups are a great way to do it. I'm really excited to see how many are popping up. And I love them because, you know, they're so accessible to people. Anyone can come. And there's a lot to be said for that hands-on, face-to-face interaction, you know, walking someone through setting up a wallet, um, you know, helping them with security, all of that, that's really important um, because not everyone, although, you know, most people in this country have internet access, not everyone can, uh, you know, look up these things and, you know, read through them and really get a firm grasp of how to use Bitcoin or what Bitcoin is. Um, and I, I think it's one of one of the best ways to get it out. I, I think we're going to kind of see uh, different approaches and uh, different types of meetups too. Uh, you could even have meetups kind of split out and branch out, specializing in different things. And I, I think that's great. So and even uh, you know, kind of making things a little more structured within the meetup groups. Uh, you know, getting out a, a script people can take to places to kind of pitch them Bitcoin things like that. Um, so yeah, I think it's really effective. It, it adds that face-to-face interaction that a lot of people need, especially a lot of people who, you know, maybe, maybe older generations, different types of people uh, getting involved too because, uh, you know, a lot of us are really familiar with using the internet and things like that. But, but a lot of your older people, a lot of the ones at least that I've talked to that are interested are very, very apprehensive. They're, they're very, um, almost, some of them are almost afraid of it. Like they still think of it as like, oh, it's just like you know a bunch of porno sites and stuff. Like they're very hesitant to use it. But if you can, uh, you know, meet them face to face and walk them through it, I think they're going to be much more likely to jump on. So yeah, the, they're a great thing, and yeah, one of the best ways to get the word out. I agree. A lot of great ideas talked about here, and I think it is really magical to give someone their first Bitcoin, a little bit of it and then to see it in their wallet and then they could send it to someone else and someone else across the table and then you could donate it to the pizza fund that that's just a QR code that's printed out on the table. I think there's a lot of easy real world examples where you can show off the power of Bitcoin even if you're in a restaurant that doesn't take Bitcoin having one person pay the bill and then paying Bitcoin to that person directly during the meetup as a demonstration maybe even calling the manager over and saying, watch this, they're about to pay me for the bill, and all they have to do is scan this QR code. 2014 is the year of the meetup, and the year of total Bitcoin adoption. Exit question, have you joined or started your local meetup group yet? Will Pengman. Yes, and I just want to echo what you were saying, Thomas, about the joys that people experience with their first Bitcoins. You know, every week we make sure that any new member who comes to the meetup uh, who doesn't already have a Bitcoin wallet or some Bitcoins, they get some. And they're always amazed at how quick and easy it is to receive some Bitcoins. They look up like, what was that it? And yeah, that was it. And they see it and how fast it is. And it's just an eye-opening experience for them. I never get tired of, you know, sharing that with people. Um, and again, you know, the, the venue that we hold meetups accepts Bitcoin. So if I'm closing my tab out at the end of the night because I like to, you know, share, um, you know, show people that, hey, yeah, you can run a tab and you can pay in Bitcoin and here, check it out. And there's always patrons who didn't attend our meetup upstairs at the venue we use. And um, they're there watching me, you know, sometimes tired at the end of a long meetup, pay, uh, pay up for the tab. And they ask what's going on. And four months ago or more, uh, they would say, you know, I'd say, oh, I'm paying in Bitcoin, and they'd be like, what's that? And in the last three, four months, I mentioned that to, I don't know, every every night that I've checked out there, every, every week, and the, the response I get is, oh, yeah, I know what that is. Wow, that was it? That you're just paid bad genie in Bitcoin? Wow. You know, it's, um, I might retract what I said that uh, 2014 is the year of total acceptance because everyone has it in their lexicon now, and, um, you know, the hard work of, of um, uh, defining Bitcoin for people is kind of done thanks to a lot of um, major media exposure of at least the term and then we can do the rest of the work in showing how Bitcoin is for everybody like Derek said during the CFR topic. 
Bitcoin is for everybody. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter your, you know, what demographic you come from. It's for everybody. It attracts certain types of people um, initially, and that's okay. But I get, I, I really do get off on showing people how it's for everybody. Excellent. Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, yes, I, I'm a member of a number of Bitcoin uh, meetups, and I've started uh, one myself. Uh, one thing I did for the meetup I started was uh, we implemented a uh, well-defined anti-harassment policy uh, with enforceable action and clear directions to create a safe and welcoming environment uh, for, for people of all uh, walks of life uh, to create diversity within the environment. One of the things we have to be careful about is the fact that Bitcoin is still male-dominated, white-dominated, English-speaking dominated, and these environments can appear at least unwelcoming uh, to people from other, uh, from other walks of life, uh, to people of other genders, <laughs> to people of uh, minority status. And uh, anti-harassment policies are necessary because we're already seeing uh, some nasty events happen. Uh, so you need to create a welcoming environment as well as an enforcement mechanism. Derek J. Yep, I helped start Bitcoin Philadelphia. Uh, the website is bitcoinphl.com, and one of the things that our group has decided to focus on is creating a wiki of wikis, which anyone can participate in, and I invite you to do that. Um, where there's lots of information about Bitcoin on the net, but if you're really just getting started, it can be overwhelming, and so we want to develop a wiki of wikis that can link to other wikis and help help people get started in a way that makes a lot of sense and is uh, easy for first-time users. So yeah, BitcoinPHL.com is the website, and we meet up uh, once a week every every uh, Wednesday in Philadelphia. Davi Barker. I've attended a couple of my local meetups, both in Sunnyvale and in San Francisco. A couple weeks ago, I actually attended the meetup in Portland, um, but I wouldn't say that I make a habit of it. Megan Lords. So this is something the Sean's Outpost crew down here in Pensacola is, have been talking a lot about. We've been trying to uh, figure it out, and I'm happy to announce that Pensacola will be having its first meetup tomorrow night. So we're really excited. Um, we've kind of all been working independently, uh, just spreading the word about Bitcoin, at least in Pensacola, which is a smaller city compared to uh, a lot of where these, where these other meetups take place. Um, but I'm really excited because I think this will help us get more organized and I, uh, you know, help us uh, reach out to local businesses more efficiently. Uh, so I'm really excited, uh, and you know, I've seen the success of the other ones. I've kind of, of course, I'm kind of limited to Pensacola, but I, uh, but yeah, I'm really excited about the potential, and I, uh, yeah, it'll it'll be starting officially tomorrow night. So. Excellent. And I've been uh, joining Bitcoin Sacramento, and we're working on uh, getting ready for the Kings. It's going to be big. So now moving on to questions and answers. Let's see. Questions. Uh, how many of you are not wearing any pants? Let's see. The next question. What do you think could be the demise of Bitcoin? Two of us, but I won't tell you which ones. <laughs> So what do you think could be the demise of Bitcoin? The ever-increasing sinking times? The increasing centralization of miners? Even censorship? I'm pro-Bitcoin, but I just want some reassurance about the potential problems. Andreas Antonopoulos. You know, I, I think external factors uh, can no longer affect Bitcoin other than temporarily causing little price dumps and which are followed by rallies. So I'm not worried about external factors anymore. Uh, centralization of mining is self-correcting. Um, the uh, sinking blockchain bloats, uh, the, all of those issues are, are getting solved and are not particularly serious. 51% uh, attacks don't concern me. Uh, probably the only scenario I can see where Bitcoin can be infected is a deep-seated bug in the, the ECDSA signature algorithm that causes uh, uh, private addresses to leak, and that is highly improbable, and it's probably the most scrutinized cause in Bitcoin. I really don't see any failure scenarios right now. Um, I am extremely optimistic. I think Bitcoin is good enough, and once it achieves network effect, it's pretty much unstoppable. 
Yeah, I want to add that I agree, and I'm not concerned about Bitcoin in particular, but if I were, if there were vulnerabilities in Bitcoin, it would be easy enough to switch over to some other cryptocurrency. So it's really not a concern for uh, people in this economy. Right, exactly. Bitcoin the, cur Bitcoin the network survives Bitcoin the currency. The invention can't possibly go away. Yeah, I'm Next particularly question. fascinated by some of the offline means of transacting. I mean, uh, one project that I've heard of that is super interesting to me is transmission of Bitcoin transactions over ham radio. Um, try and stop that. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yep, uh, you can do shortwave bursts of transactions. There are 350 bytes. You can transmit that transaction in about eight seconds over a shortwave radio from the middle of a forest. Yeah, good luck stopping that. You can't detect the transmission. You can't tr uh, detect who's receiving and the person receiving could be 300 miles away. Um, that's going to have a, a really important impact because that means you can do transactions in the middle of guerrilla warfare. <laughs> and you that's what order. everyone will be thinking about in the middle of guerrilla warfare. How do you I send money? Order more arms. Well, from well, from well if, if, you're, if you're sending money in order to get more arms delivered uh, and you're a Syrian rebel, that's exactly what you're thinking about. So, Because right now their only alternative is uh, suitcases full of cash hidden in container ships. Let's see. The next question is small cheap AP, small cheap ATMs and Piper Bitcoin wallet machines should be talked about more. What do you guys Derek, what do you think about small Bitcoin ATMs? I like them. I'm surprised people aren't using them more often. I've got time over my head or I'd be the brave guy to say, "Yeah, let's put this out here. Let's use start using these things." What the everybody. I mean, I know that there there are some in New York, there are some that uh, people as, who are part of uh, Bitcoin Philadelphia have bought. Where are they? Why can't I go to one? Well said, Derek. Next question. Coder Trader checking in. What do you all think about the weak looking price action in Bitcoin? It looks like a major pullback is around the corner. Also, have you considered the option that the technology of Bitcoin could be successful, but the price could fall? Davi Barker, what do you think about the price? If this person's able to predict the price of Bitcoin, then they should be able to make a fortune on it. And they should get it right on that. <laughs> uh, you know, if Bitcoin drops down to a penny, it still works. So um, that's okay with me. I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. I like the idea that I have sort of secured some value in the, the process of adopting it. Uh, but I, there, as long as it has a price, and I think it always will have a price, it can operate as a currency. I do think there is some worry right now with the government selling $25 million in Bitcoin that may cause a temporary retreat in the price. And the way that those Bitcoins are put back into the market could affect the price, although it seems very unlikely that the government would sell them on an exchange causing a massive price dump. It looks more like a deal with the Winklevi or a deal with the second market ETF where the large amount of funds are exchanged off the books not affecting anything seems to be the most likely option for the government money. But the uncertainty will probably cause a, a price decline. Oh Whoops, my god, the other side of that trade sucks. Oh my god, let's get a price decline. Let, I would love to get a price decline. Why right? are we upset about this? Are we crazy? What this means is that suddenly $25 million of new supply will jump into the market. The fundamentals haven't changed. And that means that that price is a massive discount for us to buy Bitcoin. Who is complaining about this? I would love to see Bitcoin at 200 temporarily with no change in the fundamentals, significantly undervalued and available for me to buy. I'll be on the other side of that transaction. Hey, FBI, if you can hear this, sell me your $25 million <laughs> of Bitcoin. <laughs> I'll put them right back yeah. in the market. I want the federal government to be illiquid in li in Bitcoin. Everyone else, Bitcoin well, if is they liquid. Sell them, they the will be illiquid. It doesn't work. If they sell them, they will be illiquid. They'll 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 give up their precious Bitcoin and replace them for crappy dollars. I mean, what better way to divest the government of Bitcoin first? They've hey. already made a fourfold return from six million dollars to twenty-four million dollars. You think that would be enough for them? Like, just give them to the Federal Reserve, put them in a bank, hold them. No, sell them, drop the price, give us a discount, let us buy them back, and give you useless dollars in return. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, and I gotta say, like, one thing I think. 
one thing I think the, 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 the person who asked the question is most concerned about is how much the price can move when new pools of liquidity enter the market. And that's, you know, that's certainly a concern because the amount of transactions that are happen on an exchange move the price so drastically, whereas the amount of transactions that happen off exchange, um, you know, are really what's, what I'm more interested in, what most of us true believers are probably more interested in. And that's, that's where I see the potential for, uh, that's, where, that's where we see the value of Bitcoin uh, walking the walk, so to speak. And that's, what it, that's what's interesting to, that, to me. And Andreas, you say this all the time, throw the price out of your mind and don't pay attention to it. The more interesting uh, metric is user adoption. And, and I fully am wedded to that, uh, to that position. I'm in favor of ignoring what the government does with their Bitcoin. I, I, don't, I don't care. I don't want it to enter into my thinking. I don't want it to... I mean, if the price drops for whatever reason it drops, that I will respond to. But, I mean, I would rather ignore them, even at this point. The yeah. next question. Don't you think that hydroponic shops and their customers would love Bitcoin, especially in countries with oppressive prohibition? Davi Barker, what do you think about that? Hydroponics shops, meaning shops that sell equipment to grow marijuana? Is that what we're talking about? That's what we're talking about, yes. <laughs> oh, no, uh, you use the yeah, M word. Of course. <laughs> Why wouldn't they? Because they aren't smart enough to protect themselves and use it wisely. That's why. They're, they're going to entrap themselves. That's, that's and... a stereotype. You're just encouraging stereotypes that Cheech and Chong run hydroponic stores. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I have like a... Good corporations that can understand Bitcoin. No, no. Not the, not the companies that are going to uh, not understand the, the currency. I'm saying that it could be the users who are ending up buying these things are using their cell phones to purchase the equipment, and the NSA or whatever equivalent there... Uh, says, okay, I see John Smith, you've just purchased this equipment, now we're going to raid your house. Not if they use Bitcoin and had an anonymizing service. Also, we're talking about a brave new world where essentially the great fear of the online Silk Road becomes the real-life Silk Road, and people start exchanging plants for Bitcoin for lights that grow plants, and there's no one else involved in their economy. It's a completely closed loop. I think it would be great. Uh, I made a prediction last week that dispensaries would be accepting Bitcoin. Uh, I'd love to see hydroponic shops accepting it. And, uh, you know, the huge irony in this whole uh, legalization thing is that a lot of people are pushing for legalization, and a lot of that's going to be taxed, which is going to be money that's funneled back to the drug war. So Bitcoin is a great way to escape that. You know, just on the subject of legalization, this came up with a friend of mine recently. He discovered that... Uh, because he pursued whatever paperwork he needed in California to purchase and use marijuana legally, he can no longer own a firearm. And yeah. so these are the sort of the side effects, the, the, these are the earmarks that are in the bills whenever the state tries to legalize anything. So um, I just wanted to throw that out as a warning to people who've been clamoring for legalization all of this time, that um, they are always going to find a way to screw you. <laughs> Wait, wait, hang on. Are you trying to tell me that uh, purchasing lights and watering systems to grow a plant that's a weed and grows by the side of the road is still illegal? Where? Are we insane? What the hell is wrong with this world? <laughs> <laughs> and, and also remember that the cousin of the plant, hemp, is made illegal because it looks too much like marijuana and it confuses federal agents who can't tell a field of hemp from a field of pot. This you is why we looks can't like grow marijuana? industrial hemp. Japanese maple. When I was in high school, we used to pick leaves off of Japanese maples because they look just like marijuana plants, and our school prohibited that. Yeah, you know, I mean, one, the, other, one other I comment you, on get, the... I get high one when other I comment on, maple syrup, so yeah, that was probably the same plant. You know, it's not just uh, people who are interested in growing marijuana or growing hemp or growing any plant hydroponically that are getting harassed um, because their transactions are being monitored. It's people who want to start up aquaponics systems, which are, you know, self-sustaining yes. permaculture setups that are really a fantastic innovation in agriculture that almost anyone can do locally. There's a little startup cost for that. And most metro areas have a business that is setting this up for their local economy 
you know, and, and starting a cooperative to, to get this going. And I'm hearing all the time, I know it's happened to a couple of the businesses like that here in Milwaukee, where they make their purchases for their business. They're out in the open, operating lawfully, and they still get visits and harassment, if you will, just because they want to set up a kind of permaculture system having nothing to do with any narcotics, illegal drugs, or any illegal activity. So, um, you know, it's not just them. And, and this is all because everything is being so heavily monitored with this NSA stuff in the news and, and the speech Obama gave today um, and all the revelations that have been coming out since the spring and, uh, you know, Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald and, and their work. This is, um, again, a great example of a use case for Bitcoin that, uh, you know, we're seeing all the time. You know, banks won't allow these dispensaries in Colorado that are operating lawfully to hold their deposits. They won't accept them as depositors. And they don't have, the headlines are, they don't have anywhere else to put their money. And I'm just like face palm, big time, you know. Um, <laughs> there's an obvious answer. Yeah, yeah to those, add on to... Uh, to add on to the aquaponics thing, I mean, they they even ban certain types of fish. You know, like you can't use certain types of tilapia in Florida here for your aquaponics system. A another wave, if you could like find someone on, oh, I don't know, Craigslist, for example, selling these illegal tilapia or whatever, and pay them in Bitcoin, a way kind of around that. So, go ahead, sorry. Oh, these Moving same on. organizations, these same banks allow you to give donations to the KKK, they allow you to buy an AK-47, and they certainly don't have any problem with holding the bank accounts of Philip J. Morris, or sorry, ARIA, as they're now called. Moving on, the next question. Not sure if this has been discussed yet, but are any of you concerned with how close Ghash got to 51% recently? Are there any ideas that would help us avoid this? I don't know who wants no, to. No, the problem was resolved. Um, like uh, Andreas said, it's a self correcting system, and we have nothing to worry about there. All right, can we just clarify this? If somebody gets 51%, they can't take your money, they can't change the transactions, they can't unroll the transactions. All they can do is put two spending transactions in the next block until everybody notices and shuts them down. This is not a problem. And even if it was a problem, it's the most ridiculously unprofitable and unproductive use of enormous amounts of computing power. And if it is a matter of pool, the pool will be deserted automatically with a market response. Can we please stop talking about the 51% attack, finally? There are so many other more interesting, um, I guess, arguments for uh, flaws in the protocol than the 51% attack that I've seen. Uh, the paper out of Cornell with the 25% scenario, slightly more interesting, and slightly, you know, maybe more troubling than the 51% attack. But again, these are all theoretical arguments and what we're seeing in practice. Well, thank God for Bitcoin because it gives us a way to actually see for one time uh, a a free market in operation, unencumbered, uninhibited by um, large actors, you know, uh, imposing themselves on it. And so, again, the example, the rebuttals that are often uh, wielded against the argument for a, a free market economy is we've never seen that succeed. Corruption always takes over. You know, there will be um, mobs and gangs ruling, whatever, you know. The fact of the matter is we're, we get to see it with Bitcoin. Bitcoin walks the walk, and it doesn't care. And it proves that this is possible. Um, and anyone who doubts, like, you know, the Paul Krugmans out there, they're proven wrong on a daily basis. And also when big events hit the news stream, uh, it, it shows their folly. It, it exposes the hypocrisy or the folly of these trite arguments against uh, an open system. Listen, we have real problems in the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, we need to have stronger fungibility in the transactional layer. We need to have strong anonymity within the protocol because right now, uh, very large organizations are taking every transaction in every part of the blockchain and they're creating massive taint trees and doing relationship analysis and then they're cross-tying that to IP addresses and everything else and prior transactions and any thread of identity you have to unravel the entire set of identities in the protocol. That's a real problem, and in this country it will result in IRS audits, and in other countries it will result in a bullet in your head. 
So we need to fix that before this protocol goes mainstream and we can't do any upgrades anymore because it's too difficult to upgrade. Uh, that's a real problem, not the 51%. Well put. Next question. Do you think that the court ruling, I think this is about net neutrality, will spur things like fiber optic networks, like Google Fiber? It won't spur anything. It will, it will uh, completely slow down innovation and growth on the Internet because now... Uh, in order to innovate and grow, uh, you have to ask permission from the cable providers, and they're not going to give you access to the websites that you want. They're going to slow them down and prioritize their own traffic. Wait a minute. Maybe I misunderstand what net neutrality the, and the whole bill uh, had, Andreas, but it, is uh, the barrier to entry impossibly high for new cable providers? Is it not a possibility that new entrants can enter the market? Yeah, the barrier to entry has always been high in the physical deployment of networks because you need to dig the street, and digging the street requires permits from local communities. Uh, fragmented and overlapping jurisdictions, it's very difficult to do it on any large scale. It took over 15 years to do, and all of the cable companies we see today are essentially agglomerations of thousands of small providers that got gradually bought up into these giant cartels. And now they wield tremendous power. They are gay. I, I understand with that, power. but it's not impossibly high. There's still uh, there are still ways that new entrants could enter the market. Correct. I mean, you could the things that haven't been thought of yet. For example, having drones that provide Wi-Fi. I mean, the, some something like that, like something new. Yes, but essentially the internet as we know it's the very easy access directly to a worldwide network with a global audience that uh, is now severely curtailed and I think that that's going to slow things down dramatically for everyone. I think I part of the want to agree part with of the question on this thing. I think I, want, I wanted to agree with Andreas on this. Go ahead Thomas. I think um, part of the question what it's saying is that it could lead to a development of Verizon fiber where you can get Verizon programs faster and you can get Verizon websites and all the things on the Verizon network. Who still but uses Verizon? A bunch of crooks. Well, it appears so. Have a I mean, conscience. Cut, cut off your relationship with that abusive company. Well, and remember that Verizon is going to get paid bribes by the content pr providers to make their content go faster. So they have a relationship with the NFL. So obviously NFL games should stream faster than, say, the Bitcoin group. Whereas the other internet would say NFL streams and Bitcoin group streams can be the same speed. No one has to bribe. So you can see why they prefer the bribe system. Derek, your comment about the barrier of entry for new ISPs, you know, ones that might have some innovative ideas in distributing um, internet access, is... You know, it's something or I encountered something like with one Open of the Garden, first entrepreneurs. Free. One of the, uh, you know, one of my first entrepreneurial ventures. Um, it's it's uh, it's something that's built, but it's something that probably won't work in the U.S. Um, it was like a, a Wi-Fi sharing social network that pays back the the sharers, and it's you know a reputation based like Tinder. Uh, system where you know you have preferred um, you have you build up your reputation so that you can be trusted to share someone's private network. Um, this directly competes with all of the major ISPs. All you know there's like five of them in the nation or something, and it's it you know there's very very uh, difficult legal workarounds to try and get this idea off the ground in the United States. It's certainly something that's very applicable to developing nations that suffer for internet access um, would certainly be applicable there. But it's definitely, there's definitely a high barrier to entry. Um, it, you know, that isn't uh, because of um, resources necessarily, it's because of legal red tape. All right, to Derek's point, I think, uh, you know, we're reaching a point where perhaps the internet has finally reached uh, the maximum level of freedom that it could reach. And now it's a long, slow slide down. And what we have to do is spend uh, the next several years disrupting the Internet, just like the previous hierarchical systems, by making more open and decentralized solutions like Open Garden. And, you know, maybe it's time to start disrupting the Internet. All systems that provide equality at first eventually are captured and corrupted from the top, and then they need to be disrupted from the bottom up again. And perhaps the Internet, you know, as much as it equalized access to information, has now reached uh, the highest level of liberty that it will ever reach. 
and from here on it's a long slow slide and we need to disrupt the hell out of it and guess what we're going to fund that disruption with Bitcoin this is an incredibly depressing idea Andreas that we've reached peak internet freedom and that we're now in the decline of internet freedom well the combination of completely ubiquitous NSA surveillance on an open protocol together with the loss of net neutrality you know, I, I think uh, we'll look back and uh, look at our current government. For example, Obama's legacy will be the destruction of internet liberty, um, and, uh, and and we have reached peak internet freedom, most likely. We we might still have a chance. There, there may be a backlash that's big enough, uh, but you know, uh, people don't really understand network neutrality. They don't understand how the internet delivers this incredible innovation and all the benefits it it delivers. And they're willing to be, uh, you know, to be bamboozled into uh, watching faster NFL games. Um, I'm not that optimistic about the future of the internet because it's been a struggle from day one, uh, and it's it's been a constant war. And sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. And this last year has not been good. Derek J. Yeah, it's always a war for ideas, and I think it's important that we uh, take personal responsibility for promoting as many good ideas about freedom as possible. Well, I think, Andreas, if there's any hope, like George Orwell said, it lies with the proles, I think it lies with the programmers, because we knew how to build this Internet right the first time, right? Richard Stallman was yelling in our ear to use open source. Everyone who was anyone said, use encryption. But everyone else said it's too difficult for the users. We need to do it quickly. We need to do it faster. And then all of the faster solutions seemed to win in the economic sphere just because they were faster, not because they were better than Linux or better what Linux could provide. They were just ahead of Linux. I think we could see a whole new internet built by programmers with end-to-end -end encryption that starts and begins with anonymity that could rise up in the place of this old internet but we won't be able to get really fast NFL games. So. Oh dear. <laughs> but we will be able to get NFL games with Bitcoin. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's the other neat part about how we're going to build this internet too is that now we can attach money to everything with Bitcoin. Whereas before, I, you know, people didn't really get paid directly for TCP IP or for adding to an open source project. Now there's an opportunity for bounties or for donations or for you know some other Bitcoin related thing. So we've got a lot more options. It's not it's not so bleak. The you know, Obama speech today was pretty rough. I haven't watched it yet, but I watched the after coverage. It was it was pretty rough. They said that he tried to humanize the NSA because we should have a warmer relationship with the people who are tracking everything, everything, everything that we ever do. So. I, I have a very warm relationship with them. I have a more intimate relationship with them than anybody else in my life because uh, yeah. they watch all of my other internet <laughs> relationships in full color HD video every time I have them. Well, and I've always had a problem with backups. No matter how many backups you do, you always lose something. Categorizing your own data can be so difficult at times. I'm glad that the NSA has a second backup for me, and I look forward to getting access to it. I've lost some things. I, I want them back. <laughs> they should really rename it to the National Storage Agency, which will give you a warm and fuzzy feeling as a big backup company. Well, we just need access to it. They just need a Facebook front end for all of our data. And, and make sure that people can't search for other people. We have to restrict access to that. So. Will we see any uh, wrongfully, uh, wrong, um, wrongfully convicted uh, criminals exonerated from you know some some NSA backup material that can uh, serve to bolster their case? Well, there have already been uh, more than a dozen cases of uh, defense attorneys uh, doing subpoenas to find in cases of parallel construction uh, where such data was used and to subpoena information. Uh, some of those cases are currently working their way out through the Second Circuit and also the Ninth Circuit of Appeals. Uh, so, yeah, as, as funny as it sounds, actually, uh, that, that may be a, a possibility. It would certainly mess up their game completely. <laughs> Moving on to predictions. Honorable mention. Last time on the show, Megan predicted that a marijuana dispensary would accept Bitcoin. I'm told that that's now true in Colorado. 
Excellent prediction, Megan. We'll see if you can do as good this week. And now, predictions. Are you ready, Derek J? Prediction. The Super Bowl will have a Bitcoin-related ad. Ooh. Davi Barker. We are going to see um, a trend of undercover FBI agents attending Bitcoin meetups in an attempt to sell illicit substances. Megan Lords. Okay, so I read this interesting article on Forbes today about the International Monetary Fund. Uh, let's see, the headline is, The International Monetary Fund lays the groundwork for global wealth confiscation. So basically they're saying if we can just take a large amount of money from the wealthiest people uh, in the world and then redistribute it that just once, if we can convince people that we're just going to do it once, that you know maybe people will sign on to it. I predict that not only is Bitcoin already going to be better at helping people who do actually need it, but it's going to really emerge as a uh, source for dealing with the poverty problems that we see all around the world. And I think we're going to be able to kind of push back against the IMF with that. Will Pangman. The uh, aftermath of Gavin's visit with the CFR will be a surprisingly positive press release from the CFR. Andreas Antonopoulos. Well, I'm hoping to see uh, more mainstream wallets implementing coin join and atomization technologies by default, always on and impossible to turn off for every transaction. And I expect we're going to see the first uh, wallets that implement that uh, in Q1 of this year. Major League Baseball loves new technology. They already have their tickets available on Passbook. Apple's ticketless ticket system. Major League Baseball also loves to act as a group. There's plenty of time before opening day and still time to make a splash. Major League Baseball will accept Bitcoin following the incredible success of the Sacramento Kings. 2014 will be the year of Bitcoin. Don't you forget it. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>